thank you for the opportunity to to be here. I uh, I'm I'm really honored to get invited. I think Andrew uh, had a good connection with a, another MIT uh, alumni that I'm a friend with, and got introduced. Um, so. I think Andrew told me that um, I'll leave it mostly, um, uh, I'll do a brief intro and, and tell you a little bit of history of the company founding and then um, have time for you to ask me a lot of questions on, on what you would like to know uh, really. And I, I'll give you my point of view obviously and that's just one data point. I don't dare to call it advice or anything like that because every business is very unique, very different uh, and you can take it and hopefully apply it to what you do. Um, so obviously you have a fantastic group here, um, and who am I to, to tell you what's right? Um, so yeah, um, I'm, I'm a techie by, by training. I, uh, I came to this country as an immigrant. Uh, I was born in Vietnam, I came when I was 11, one of the boat people you might have read about. Um, and, uh, and this is in the mid 80s. Uh, I live with my aunt and uncle in San Jose, not too far from here. Uh, and I went to half of middle school <laughs> and, and high school in public school in San Jose, uh, which now looking back is one of the worst, uh, you know, schooling system there there is, but hey, it's free. Uh, and got into MIT uh, not knowing anything more than just this is, should be a cool school for people who like math and science, which I was into. Um, uh, so, so, yeah did my, my bachelor and master's there, and then got out, uh, got recruited to join Silicon Graphics. That was still a hot company back in the, uh, in the late 90s, uh, and start working there. But yeah, in starting in 2000, I start joining startups, and, and I never look back. I never want to be in a huge company setting ever again, um, because the impact you can make as an individual uh, at a smaller setting is, is tremendous. Uh, so anyways, in 2003, I joined this company where I met my co-founder, Conrad, um, and we uh, worked on software that nonprofits would use. Uh, so if you ever donated to like the Red Cross or, or like Planned Parenthood or you're part of an organization that you would write to your Congress or, or senators or something like that on some issues, you're, you're on the system we built because none of these organizations want to do this themselves, right? They outsource all these IT uh, to companies like, like the one we were at. Um, so yeah, that one got acquired by a larger competitor, Con Convio, um, and then uh, it had a small IPO, like Diego mentioned. Um, so all this time though, um, I've had this what's for dinner problem. And when I was younger in college, I can eat pizza every day, it didn't matter. But when I started to get older, and then by now, I, you know, I'm married, I, I had kids at the time uh, who were young, and so eating becomes important. Um, and, and I knew that eating healthy becomes uh, something that's actually make an impact on my productivity. If I eat bad food, it actually have a negative influence on me, and, and I actually feel drowsy and just not productive. Um, so for a long time, um, in my little household with my wife and I, she does not cook. She's, she's a classic city girl. <laughs> I met her when I was at MIT, she was at Boston University, she's a city girl, she does not cook. And maybe she never wants to learn to cook because she knows I can't. Uh, so, so this whole dilemma about at the end, each work day, she would text me, hey honey, what's for dinner? It's not just a question of literally what will be what we will be eating for dinner, but it's an insinuation like, are you gonna cook something tonight? So that pressure that I now fully understand a lot of stereotypically women in most countries, including this one, tend to feel at the end of each work day, assuming they go to work, then they have to put food on the table and then they potentially get judged by their own family members about whether that was any good, right? That's, that's crazy. I mean, so I had this pressure in me for years. Um, so, you know, I left that in the back of my head, and, and then there was a neighbor that I used to live across from the street from. He has an older son, same age as my boy, and they play together. He shared a lot of food with us, and I learned that he was a former personal chef. He used to go into people's home, cook up a storm, six, eight hours, whole day there. Spent a whole day at, at this random client's home, and put the food in the, in the refrigerator, and when the client comes home from work, enjoy it over the next few days. 
And he charged an arm and a leg for it. It's like $400, $500, sometimes $700 per engagement, depending on how much food he cooked. Uh, so I was like, yeah, thank you for sharing great food with us. I can't afford a service like that. So anyways, this is all happening in the back of my mind. And, and when this other company that I was at had a small IPO, I saved a tiny little bit of money. I'm not a founder or anything of that company. Uh, but as an employee, I had a little bit of stock and, and save up some money for, from that. And I, I, I walked up to my wife and I was like, honey, can I, can I give this a shot? Can I do this? And you'll be the sole breadwinner for, for as long as I can imagine. Maybe we'll give this for a year or two and if it doesn't work, I'll go get a job or something. <laughs> and so, uh, so she was like, yes, absolutely. So, so that's how the company started, in my living room. And I would beg chefs to, that I found on Yelp. I would go to Yelp and you know, look up chefs and find anyone and then I cold call them. I would say, hey, I'm a random person interested in getting your food just to get their, them to answer me back. And then I start talking about this concept of munchery. And it was really weird. They're like, what the hell is this? <laughs> and, and I had to beg them literally, like, I'll pay you for you to cook extra meals and I'll sell it to customer. And for the first few months of the company, we only launched in San Francisco and I did all the deliveries in the city myself for the first five months or so. Um, thank you. Uh, it's not because it's a noble thing to do or anything like that. It's because I was the only one. <laughs> so, <laughs> but no, really, I understood what it takes to do delivery efficiently. Uh, even nowadays, until today, like this, this text alert that customers get when we're a few minutes away, that's, I started that back when I did it. Um, because I knew people wanted to know when I'm coming. Uh, and then it's just also an opportunity to ask people, hey, what do you like? What do, what do you want to see on the menu? What, what can we do to improve the service? So yeah, that's how the company started, very humbly like that. All bootstrapped it by my own money, Conrad's money. We had no outside investment until much later, uh, where we raised a tiny little seed round of a couple hundred thousand dollars. It's almost laughable amount of money um, by people that I actually delivered to. So the Matt Mullenweg, the, the WordPress founder, the Sunil Paul, Sidecar founder, these are people who had the same problem I had about what's for dinner, but don't want bad takeout. Because usually the option is you cook, or you go get some kind of takeout that is usually not good for you. Okay? It may be convenient. It could be even be McDonald's, right? Down the street, easy to get. But, but you know it's not good for you, so you settle. You're like, ooh, I know this is not good for me, but I don't have no time, so I have to get something like that. And even pizza, Chinese, I mean, I'm Vietnamese, so I can bash Asian food all day long. I feel okay about it. But most food that's meant for delivery is not really meant for delivery. About the only exception is pizza, where everything else, they really, even pizza, they really want you to eat it as soon as it comes out of the oven or the wok or whatever it is. That's what it's meant to be. That's called a la minute cooking. You cook it and you put it on the table and people enjoy it right away. That's best. But when it comes to people getting food at home, what's the next best thing? And, and it's usually an afterthought. People shove it in a box and <laughs> bring it to you and hopefully 30 minutes later, an hour later, sometime an hour and a half later, you know, it's unpredictable because they can't even control their own delivery staff. Um, when it comes to the customer's home and you get something that's really not designed for that, not, not meant for that. Um, so yeah, we're here to design every item for specifically this purpose, the primary purpose of delivering food to people's home or office, uh, not at a restaurant setting. Um, so yeah, that's, that's what we're about. Um, company is now four years old. Um, we are obviously serve most of the Bay Area. We go as far north as San Rafael and Marin and then all the way down through Mill Valley and all that, all of San Francisco, all of Peninsula, all the way down to Campbell. Uh, so that's how far we deliver. And then on the East Bay, we go the whole Oakland, Berkeley, Emeryville, and all the way out to like Walnut Creek. The, the way we are able to deliver so far, uh, and customer can order um, uh, same day order by placing an order by 2 or 3 p.m. for even as far out as Campbell, and we'll get there within these, this hourly window that they can choose like four to five or five to six or something like that. And we have delivery team all over the Bay Area. And then within San Francisco, there's another way of ordering, which is uh, we call on-demand ordering. So you can like at 6.30 and you're hungry or your dinner plan fell through or whatever, tap, tap, and we'll be there in 20, 25 minutes. Um, so you can get a completely whole roasted chicken, uh, natural, uh, you know, free range chicken roasted 
ready for you to put in your oven for 10, 15 minutes later to, to warm it up. So the key format for us is it's chilled. It does not come to you hot. This preserves quality. This gives you the convenience to eat it when you're ready to eat, not when our delivery person arrives, which may not be the same time. Um, and that allows us to have a bunch of variety on the menu and allow us to deliver as far as all those areas I just told you about. Uh, we don't attempt to do hot food because if we were to do hot food, it cannot be a piece of steak or a piece of filet of salmon that we serve you today. Because that kind of stuff, you have to heat it really hot and then you hope to put it in a box. Remember what I told you earlier about Chinese food or pizza, and then get it to the customer and then by then it's lukewarm anyways. Or you're trying to keep it hot in the car, it will overcook the protein. It will destroy it anyways. So chill format is a key for us. Allow us to have a bunch of like 12, 15 entree in the menu changing every day, a bunch of appetizers, side item, kids menu, beverages, dessert, uh, you name it. So we have all sort of stuff, 40, 50 things in the menu. Um, so yeah, we're in Bay Area, Seattle. Uh, we also launch in New York. We cover most of Manhattan and starting to go over to Brooklyn. Uh, and then in LA, we now deliver from Santa Monica all the way through to downtown LA. Um, so that's LA and New York are the two newest, uh, relatively newest city compared to, to here and Seattle, which was a year and three months ago or something like that. Um, so yeah, it's a very different model. Uh, comparing us to, let's say, a Chipotle or a Shake Shack or even McDonald's, obviously these are huge companies and they're very successful, not bashing them or anything like that, but it, the model is just different in that for them, they need to, you know, like in the Bay Area here, in the same geo that we cover, Chipotle would need 40 stores to serve that same region. And that's great because the 40 stores act as their marketing, right? You see it. And so you walk into it and it's convenient for you and all that. We exist only in the ether somewhere, right? You have to get an app or go to the website or something like that. So we have the challenge of getting the word out more than they do because they have stores. But each of those stores cost them a lot, a million, million and a half into the ground to put one into place. Uh, and then it only brings on average about two million in, in revenue a year per store. Uh, for us, one single kitchen can serve the whole, the whole region. Uh, and, and the limit is how far our delivery team can get to, and that we can deploy really quickly. If I decide to go to Pleasanton tomorrow, it'll be like that. So I don't need to wait months and months to get a facility and build up a store and whatnot. So it's just a very different uh, model, and, and capital, uh, much more efficient capital-wise. Uh, Compared, compared to like a Chipotle or McDonald's or any of these retail stores.